The seeds of the Little War were planted in a restless summer during the mid-1960s with a sit-in and student demonstrations as youth tested its strength. By the early 1970s, over 75% of the people living on Earth were under 21 years of age. The population continued to climb, and with it, the youth percentage. In the 1980s, the figure was 79.7%. In the 1990s, 82.4%. In the year 2000, critical mass. In 1967, the novel Logan's Run was released. Written by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson, it was about the future of 2116, where as a way to control the population, a rule was set in place that no one could live past their 21st birthday. On a person's 21st birthday, called Last Day, they'd report to a sleep shop where they're executed via a pleasure-inducing toxic gas. It's not presented as execution, though. The population's been trained to think this is all part of a never-ending circle, that they're ending this journey only to be reborn and start over. After the Little War, the population created a highly advanced computer complex called the Thinker that would control all aspects of their lives. They live in giant climate-controlled domed cities where they enjoy lives of absolute pleasure. Although sometimes there are people who don't want to die on their 21st birthday, so they try to escape from the city in pursuit of a fabled place called Sanctuary. These people are called Runners. To combat this, the Thinker created a special team of agents to hunt down and terminate these runners called Sandmen. One such Sandman is charged with finding Sanctuary and stopping it altogether. He's forced to become a runner and go underground to find if this mythical place exists. His name is Logan. The novel moves at warp speed with Logan and his companion Jessica traveling through an undersea city, the North Pole, and eventually off the planet. They survive a robot civil war, drug-fueled maniacal children, a cyborg that makes art out of humans, and even a Bengal tiger. The future is all about pleasure. There are drug shops, love shops, and surgeons that can change your appearance instantly. You can also have a sex partner delivered via a teleportation system. That's sort of like a physical version of chat roulette. Nolan and Johnson wrote the book in 20 days during the summer of 1965. Nolan then took another 10 days to try to fix any plot holes and give it some polish. When the two authors decided to write a book for money, they wanted to make it something that they were both interested in. They wanted to make it an epic man-against-society book, like Fahrenheit 451 and George Orwell's 1984. They took it to Bantam Books and showed it to the executive, Saul David, who turned it down. He told the duo he didn't like it. It was kind of a comic book. They shopped it around and eventually took it to Dell, who bought it in 1967. When the book was released, it received glowing reviews, many of them from outside the field of science fiction. It also sold very well. With advances in royalties, the duo made $188,000 for Logan's Run, which was unheard of for a science fiction novel. They had great hopes for the concept. They wrote it so they could sell the book first, and then if it did well, they could take it and sell it to Hollywood. They shopped it around and were looking to sell the movie rights for $100,000. They met with producer Stanley Kander, who had just purchased Zorba the Greek. He offered them $10,000 in advance against an option price of $100,000. They took the advance, but after a year, he wasn't able to get the film in production. Kanner met with the duo and pulled out a check for $40,000 and told them this was the best he could do with the film rights. They turned him down, and the producer was so upset, he ripped up the check, rolled it up into a ball, and ate it. They later met with MGM and were offered $60,000, which they turned down. A few days later, MGM offered them $100,000 with an ultimatum. They'd get the money, but the deal would give the studio all subsidiary rights. That meant the studio got everything down to the toys, comics, and even t-shirts. Also, Nolan and Johnson would get no percentage of the profits. Since they'd been shooting for this $100,000 dream figure, they were very happy with the film being an MGM, and they took the offer. MGM put the project in the hands of producer George Powell, who produced War of the Worlds. Powell was trying to get the production off the ground, but due to numerous disagreements over how the film should be handled, it stumbled into development hell. Nolan and Johnson wrote the first draft of the screenplay, which the studio wasn't happy with. They wanted it to be more bankable, while the writers wanted it to stay true to their vision. Johnson knew Robert Redford's agent and was trying to get him involved because he thought he'd be perfect for the role of Logan. Although Redford was in his 30s at the time, so he rewrote the treatment to update the age. Redford had no interest and nothing became of it. 
The studio wasn't happy with the scripts from the original writers, so they hired Richard Maibaum for $110,000 to write his version. Maibaum had just written the last several James Bond films and was in high demand, hence the large payday. He made some changes to the story. One of the biggest was the discovery that a man named Cheney Moon founded this society 200 years ago. At 21, everyone had to go, so he set an example by killing himself when he reached 21. At the end of the script, when Logan reaches Sanctuary, he finds a 200-year-old man, Cheney Moon. He was the founder as well as the original runner. Pal was friends with director Michael Anderson. He was primarily making films for MGM, like All the Fine Young Cannibals and Operation Crossbow. The two would often talk for hours about various projects, and one night, they were discussing Logan's run. Anderson liked the idea and was interested in directing. Pal agreed and wanted Anderson to direct. However, with all the work Pal put in so far, he was sure the studio was going to ask him to direct. He was so sure, in fact, that he turned down the job to direct the movie The Power. Pal went to Brazil to scout locations and loved the futuristic look of the country's new capital, Brasilia. When he returned from his trip, he found out MGM had a new leadership in power, and they canceled every single production that was in development. Pal worked for two years on the project because he really believed in it. He knew it could be something special. The studio, on the other hand, were not happy with the scripts they were shown. They felt they just weren't strong enough to justify the cost. At this point, they took Pal off the production and shelved it. It did come off the shelf from time to time over the next couple years. Irwin Allen was set to produce Logan's run as a follow-up to his blockbuster The Towering Inferno. There was a deal in place to make it a joint collaboration between Fox and MGM, with a budget of around $15 million. For some reason, the deal fell through at the last minute. Finally, MGM decided to move ahead with the production. They just had two back-to-back -back sci fi hits with Westworld and Soylent Green. They thought it would finally be the right time for this movie. They took the property and gave it to MGM story editor Saul David. In an ironic twist, David left Bantam Books to become a movie producer. He was now in charge of producing Logan's Run, the movie based on the book that he didn't like. He was assigned to the property and openly admitted he still didn't like it. He sent a memo to the heads of the studio of all the changes that needed to be made. Stanley Greenberg was hired to write a new script when MGM reactivated the project, but was replaced shortly thereafter by David Zelig Goodman, who wrote the original Straw Dogs. Goodman then spent the next year taking the producer's concepts and incorporating them into the script. In the book, there were explanations like where the society came from, but David wanted all of that removed. He didn't want there to be any explanations. The studio had a few additional changes they wanted in order to make the film bankable. They raised the age limit from 21 to 30, which allowed a star to be cast in the title role. The scope of the action was scaled down from a worldwide stage to a single city. The Washington, D.C. segment was increased to take advantage of the bicentennial. Since disaster films were a recent hot commodity, they wanted to implement a disaster film conclusion that would provide a big explosive but not altogether necessary ending. Nolan told David the changes he made were unfortunate and only served to damage the original concept. Johnson wasn't too happy with them changing the age from 21 to 30. He said, It's very easy to give up and die at 30 or 40. Death at 21 is an exaggeration. A shock. That's why we set it at that age in the novel. MGM moved the age up to 30, watering it down. The original writers weren't happy, but the studio was and approved David to move forward with the production. David went looking for a director and met with Michael Anderson. He presented him with the script, which immediately caught his attention. This was the movie he wanted to make years ago. Anderson was so excited by the script that he took it to the studio and begged them to let him make this feature. His enthusiasm for the project was infectious. And by the time he returned home, he had a message telling him he could direct the film. Now that he had the job, Anderson met with David and Goodman to discuss some of the changes he wanted to make. He told them he wanted to enhance the book and the screenplay by bringing out the personal story. Too often in sci-fi films, the audience doesn't care about the people. They're only interested in the effects. He wanted the movie to make the audience care about Logan and Jessica. Since the population knew when they would die, they all just focused on pleasure. There was no love, only sex. There was no time for love. When writing the script, they wanted to show how they could develop love in the time where that sort of thing was foreign to them. When looking into casting, the studio wanted John Voight for the role of Logan. The director spoke with him, but he wasn't interested. Years earlier, Anderson saw Michael York in a play called Ring Around the Moon. He liked him so much, he hired him to work on a film called Conduct Unbecoming. 
After it was clear John Voight wasn't going to be in the film, the director contacted York to offer him the role. York was excited because he never worked with a studio as big as MGM before. When looking into the role of Jessica, the frontrunner for the part was Lindsay Wagner. Anderson wanted Jenny Agutter for the role. He saw her in the movie Walkabout, as well as her Emmy Award winning The Snow Goose. Unfortunately, the studio said no. They said she was a wonderful girl, but was too young. They all remembered her as a child in the magical world of Disney from years earlier. About two months later, they still hadn't cast the role. Agatha walked into the offices at MGM, and everyone agreed that she wasn't a kid anymore. They immediately offered her the part, which would be her American film debut. They originally cast William Devane to play the bad guy Francis, but he pulled out of the production, so they hired Richard Jordan as his replacement. The main cast signed on for one film and the possibility of up to two sequels. Now with the cast in place, they were ready to start filming. They planned to shoot many of the interiors on sets built at MGM in Culver City and the exteriors in various locations around Texas. When the production began, the studio set a hard limit on the budget. It was not to exceed $5 million. Even though there was 2001 A Space Odyssey, Planet of the Apes, and Silent Running, the studio was worried about spending this much money on a sci-fi film. They considered it an untested genre. They weren't sure if audiences would be interested. Keep in mind, this was still a couple years before Star Wars. Right before filming started, saw David let Nolan read the updated shooting script. He said, It was fast-moving and colorful, matching the thrust of our novel. Many changes have been made, many sections of the book eliminated. I liked our ending better than theirs. Still, I'm pragmatic about Hollywood. As an adaptation, it could have been much, much worse. Principal photography began on June 27, 1975. They built numerous miniature sets for the city. They shot footage of crowds walking along a bridge and then composited that with the miniatures and matte paintings. The miniature dome city was enormous. It was 80 square feet. The Sandman headquarters was a building they found in Dallas, Texas. The health spa was filmed at a real health spa in Dallas. The main area with the time crystal was filmed in the Great Hall, the Apparel Mart, part of a gigantic 135-acre Dallas Market Center. The Love Shop was shot in the Oz Club in Dallas. For the computers in the Sandman headquarters, production designer Dale Hennessy rented some futuristic-looking ones from Maxwell Smith, a supplier in Santa Monica who specializes in movie computers. The time crystals, also called time flowers, were glued into the actors' hands. They then attached them to wires which they hid under makeup and clothes so they could blink the proper color when shown. The costume design was by Bill Thomas, who'd been working in the industry since the 1940s. He made the costumes to represent the age groups, which matched the time crystals. Yellow was birth to 12, 12 to 24 was green, and 24 to 30 was red. He used different shades so they weren't all wearing the exact same colors. Although for the Sandmen, he designed outfits that would stand out from the other colors. Gray and black. This made them easy to spot in any scene. The lifestyle adopted by the people living in the 23rd century was more or less the hippie life. It revolved around free love, and the public wore loose-fitting garments they could get in and out of. The women didn't wear underwear, so the costumes were designed to not show too much. They wanted to show off the legs of the women by putting makeup on all of them, but it was too time-consuming and expensive, so they had them all just wear dyed pantyhose. The doctor was the director's son, Michael Anderson Jr. The doctor's assistant was Farrah Fawcett. She was originally supposed to be just an extra, but Michael York saw her playing tennis and suggested to the producers that she have a larger role. Fawcett was married to Lee Majors at the time and wasn't anywhere near as well-known as she would become in a few years. They recast her as the doctor's assistant, Holly, which was still a small part, but was larger than what she had originally. The cars were modified golf carts. In the book, when you reached last day, the person would report to a sleep shop where they were willingly executed with a pleasure-inducing toxic gas. The studio wanted to be more dramatic, so the director worked with the effects team to design the carousel. It was a huge revolving plate where the people would levitate into the air to be snuffed out by lasers. They thought it was like a futuristic version of the Colosseum in Rome. The device proved to be more troublesome than they thought. In order to get the people to rise, they had stuntmen attached to wires they painted black. The set was built at MGM. As the person was lifted into the air, the stuntmen were wearing small charges that the director could remotely detonate. They worked to film the area with and without them, so they could mask the cut with the explosion. On one take, the wires got tangled, and they had to stop. The machine couldn't turn without seriously injuring them, 
so they had about 15 men stuck in the air with no way to get them down. After some quick thinking, they brought in a forklift and got them down one at a time. Originally, they were all attached to the center by the same mechanism. They redesigned the carousel so that each person was attached to a separate mechanism, which prevented this from happening again. The masks were just modified hockey masks. The studio insisted on the film being PG. If they were going to put millions into the production, they wanted to reach the largest audience possible. This created a problem. About halfway through the film, there was an orgy. The sex shop scene in the film was, to put it mildly, controversial. They worked really hard to try to show an orgy without any explicit nudity or sexual activity. They filmed the whole thing as an elaborate dance sequence. They covered up the various body parts with tape and makeup. To choreograph the sequence, they hired European ballet master Stefan Wenna. Two months into filming Logan's run, they liked Agatha so much, MGM put her under contract for two more movies. In the novel, there's a prison called Hell, located in the North Pole. It's overseen by the robot Box, who was controlled by character actor Roscoe Lee Brown. The costume had no locomotion. The actor just had to move it around with his feet and made it appear to be on some sort of wheels. At one point, he lost his balance and almost fell over, but thankfully the crew was there to save him. Brown was shooting this at the same time he was filming the TV series McCoy, so he would often shoot his scenes here, then get on his bike and travel a few stages over to shoot his scenes for McCoy. The scene in the Frozen Underground was shot on a set at MGM. It was the middle of the summer and was sweltering hot, which made it difficult to want to act cold when they were all sweating. The frozen people were actors standing still behind layers of plastic. The prisoners that lived in hell had to resort to cannibalism after the city cut off their supplies. Aside from Box, none of this made it into the movie. There were other changes from the novel, such as Sanctuary. In the book, Sanctuary is Argos, a colony in an abandoned space station near Mars. In the movie, there is no sanctuary, but Logan finds that life can survive outside the city. In the novel, Logan meets Ballard, the leader of Sanctuary. In the movie, the characters were moved and replaced by the old man. The old man was Peter Ustinov. The director worked with him in the 1949 film Private Angelo. Anderson and Ustinov knew each other for years. Ustinov gave him his first directing job and was the godfather to one of his kids. The old man's cats were meant to represent the animal kingdom. They had about 30 or 40 of them and they each did whatever they wanted. They filmed numerous scenes and tried to keep the continuity as best they could. The picture of the old man when he was younger was a still from Private Angelo. The dam was the Water Gardens in Fort Worth, Texas. For the ending, they wanted to do something that had never been done on film before. York went to the multiplex company in San Francisco, where they were able to scan his head to make a completely three-dimensional hologram of it. York became the first star in history to perform as a hologram. The concept of the holograms gained MGM a lot of publicity. They were excited and started to call this the threshold of the next major breakthrough in the science of movie making. The holograms unfortunately couldn't be filmed as they had planned. They needed illumination from a 150-watt bulb, and they could only be viewed at a certain angle. This prevented them from being able to shoot the scene as it was intended. Instead of ditching the effect, they filmed them and showed them on TV monitors surrounding the actor. The effect was not as impressive as they had hoped. Filming took several months over the summer of 1975. After filming, Michael York kept his robe as a souvenir. The original budget was $5 million. Now, going into post, the budget nearly doubled, moving over to $9 million. While the movie was costing the studio more than they expected, they were getting excited about it. They hired Jerry Goldsmith to do the score. They sent the film in for a rating, and it didn't get the PG they hoped for, mostly because of the sex shop scene. Even though there was no explicit nudity, it still had to be drastically cut. Almost the entire dance sequence was removed in order to get a PG. They also had to remove a sequence where a box sculpts a nude embrace between Logan and Jessica in ice. Unfortunately, with that scene being removed, they had to cut out almost the entire ice prison scene. This is why Logan and Jessica get undressed and then immediately redress. They held a sneak preview, but the audience was confused. They had no idea what was going on. They also said the film was too long. To combat this, they added a text prologue to explain things. Then they called for a re-edit, where they trimmed about 15 minutes from the runtime. The film originally started out different. It started with a Sandman chasing a runner. The runner gets shot, and we see his time crystal turn black. It then fades to a white crystal and pulls back to reveal a newborn baby. This was showing how one would die, 
and a new one would be born, The Balance. The studio cut the opening because later a runner is killed, and they felt it was redundant. It did make it into the trailer, though. In the end, including the marketing budget, the film cost over $12 million. The movie was released on June 23, 1976, in 500 theaters, and went on to gross over $25 million worldwide. It was nominated for three Oscars, and won one for a special achievement in visual effects. It also won six Saturn Awards, including Best Science Fiction Film. There was even a comic adaptation from Marvel that launched with the movie, although it was canceled with issue 7. Nolan and Johnson planned to write two more Logan novels, in the hopes they'd also be turned into films. Nolan was going to write the first sequel, Logan's World, and Johnson would write the second. Since the movie was a success, they pitched Logan's World to MGM to adapt to a movie. Saul David, the producer, decided instead to take the property to TV. In 1977, CBS produced the Logan's Run TV series, which was essentially the same story as the movie, only stretched out into TV format. It only lasted one season. Logan's Run, the TV series, was released in September of 1977, and the book, Logan's World, was released in December of 1977. For some reason, Johnson didn't write the third book, so Nolan wrote Logan's Search, which was released in 1980. In 2001, he released another book in the series meant to start a new trilogy called Logan's Return. It was released as an ebook. In the 2000s, it returned to comics again in a series called Logan's Run Last Day. William F. Nolan now has 85 books to his credits, hundreds of scripts, articles and short stories covering dozens of different genres. The author was voted an official living legend by the International Horror Guild. At 92, Nolan is still a living legend. Johnson was working on his own personal spinoff of Logan's Run called Jessica's Run, a new sequel for the Logan's Run universe. Unfortunately, it was never finished because the author died on Christmas Day in 2015. In 2012, the film was going to be remade with the rumor that it was Justin Timberlake who would have been Logan. For whatever reason, the film never happened. Thankfully, Logan's Run's a classic that stands the test of time. Some of the outfits may look a little 70s sci-fi, but the concept holds just as strong now as it did back then. The movie's been referenced and parodied in everything from Family Guy to Mystery Science Theater 3000. Johnson explained the foundation of Logan's Run was about a society that exists without old people and has lost its sense of continuity. He said, It's the ultimate youth culture. In our society right now, with the old people living in nursing homes instead of with their families, this continuity has already been lost. That's why we have so many dumb 40 to 60 year old people around, because they weren't living with someone older who could pass along their accumulated knowledge. The director said he was proud of the film, and it was enjoyable to work on. He did say he wasn't happy with how the holograms looked. He said they were much more impressive in person than on film, which is understandable. There were many changes from the book to the film, some good, some bad. Overall, many of the changes came down to budget and time constraints. Some things like Deadwood, the ghost town filled with pleasure gypsies, couldn't have been done within the confines of a PG rating. I'm still shocked they thought they could do the sex shop scene and still get a PG. Logan's run was a big risk for the studio, and it paid off. It was a huge deal to make this kind of sci-fi back then, and while it wasn't as influential as Star Wars would be, it still managed to be innovative and memorable. There's a reason why it's still being mentioned, and why there's still a demand for content many decades later. Harvest day. Overwhelming, am I not? 